pedagogical, like I said, it's very easy to see what the gradient of uh, descent rule does there geometrically, why that makes sense, not just from a pure calculus perspective. And then uh, we've seen this logistic function. Uh, which uh, looked like that, right? Was taking what? The negative, the positive side. Context in which we want to start today. We're going to rename a little bit to be in sync with the notes some of these quantities. So uh, I might call this thing here net or, or, or linear. Uh, and I'm going to call this thing here uh, f and the differential. I call it F prime, like in Europe. Okay. Just to, to be in sync with the notes so we will be able to follow this. Uh, finally, for the perceptron, <coughs> so we can think of, of as a representation of the perceptron, here is the input. This is a vector xi, this is xi1 x uh, i2 up to x i d. Then I have here uh, the linear combination. These are the w's, w1, w2, w3, 4, x i4, and this is w d. And, in, and here, we're going to have two things. We're going to have first, first we're going to have this net, which is the WX product, which is the sum of uh, WDXD, right? So the, what the class, what linear class function do. And then I'm going to have, uh, then this is two-step procedure, so this is one piece, the other piece is to say, take that uh, 
net and say output. That's the stuff that's coming, going out. Is the f of net. So there's some uh, this function here f has uh, important properties. Uh, let's write it down. So one is non-linear. Another one is uh, it's a uh, model of stairs. I really want something like this, but differentiable. That will serve me well. Uh, has nice, easy differentials. Like uh, we, we've seen that in the gradient descent for logistic regression. It's easy to work with it mathematically. And maybe some other properties here. Like uh, I don't want to go into, but it's just like a good prior. We'll talk about more about priors when we talk about probabilities, probably next week or very soon. So we've seen this function, but that's not the only function that we can use here, right? I mean, you can imagine, if, especially if you if you're familiar with trigonometry, things like tangent or all kinds of other round functions that looks interesting, but not necessarily the logistic function. Now, if f is the logistic function, that is in here, uh, what is it? One over one plus e at minus x. And if we want to characterize how sharp this term is, then we can add a parameter here, beta x. And then the bigger the beta, the more the sharp this function is. That's the context in which we are uh, talking about something. Yes? And that is the same, right? The same for logistic function, and it's also the same for the perceptron. So they're the same. Right. When we did the perceptron, I don't think we use a nonlinear function on top of it. Did we? We have the linear classifier, and then we have a loss. The loss was very specific to perceptron. If you remember, the, the, the loss of the perceptron was if some points are classified correctly, leave them be. If they're not, look at how far off they are misclassified, right? It was a sum over Wx directly. It was Wx. There was no f, no logistic function there. So uh, this perceptron had, had good, good instantiation, good concrete. Uh, I give your homework has a very pedagogical example of here is a basic data set of perceptron. Play with it for a few iterations to see how the perceptron moves that hyperplane until it gets everything right. So it's a very simple thing. You have a question? Uh, yeah, so for the, you said for the correctly classified points, we're not going to add anything to the loss, but for the misclassified points, how exactly would you calculate that loss? Is it just the distance to the <coughs> right, So if you remember for the perceptron, we're here at the perceptron. The loss of the perceptron was the sum over xi misclassified, right? Misclassified or error. So that is to say wxi is negative. So it's only the points for which. Remember, I have this trick in perceptron where I don't have negative points because I move them all to the positive side. So now it's classified means leave them all to the positive side. So everything that gives me a negative here means it's on the wrong side of the plane. So the loss was over only these points, W, X, I. So the minus here, it will, it will play hand in hand with the fact that it was a negative. So this loss is definitely positive. Right, because this quantity here is negative. And the more positive it is, the more those points are on the wrong side. Notice that this summation does not include the points for which the perceptron classified them correctly. Right? It's only summing over the points that are misclassified. I think we've said this quite a few times last time. So that's, okay. that's not exactly what we want to do today. We want to use some of this stuff as a, as a starting point. So obviously, there is a grant huge uh, in-your-face limitation of all this stuff so far. So except for the decision piece, what's going on all these models? Uh, logistic regression, linear regression, perceptron, 
you name it. What's up with them? There's a problem, right? They are something in They are very good for linear models. Now, that's not too bad. There are cases where linearity is this sum over here. It's so many terms in there where linearity is actually a very powerful thing. Uh, the, the thing that's a little bit hard to see geometrically is that a line is very simple in 2D. In 3D becomes a plane. It's a little bit more complicated. And it kind of increases in complexity in 4D, 5D. Unfortunately, you cannot see that in 4D or 5D with your eyes. When you go to many, many Ds, as 100,000 Ds, that plane, which is simple, is linear, it's actually very complex. That's something that we can't really talk about today, but hopefully we'll be able to talk about by the end of the term, how this linearity, that's a strong assumption in low dimension, like in 2D or 3D, it's not that big of a deal if you have 50,000 dimensions or 100,000 dimensions. <laughs> right. uh, and the, the, the most striking example is text. Most text classifiers use some form of linear, linear uh, predictors that they do find with this high dimension plus parsing. We'll get there. But still, for many problems, it's an uh, obvious limitation, right? Uh, many data points and uh, many data sets are not linear. So how we want to complicate this to make it much more capable? Well, we're going to say, how about we stack those things, right? If you think about what I've had here, I have a bunch of inputs and an output, right? That's what I, my, 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 my schema does here. It is true that I, I didn't use a, a f function for the perceptron. The perceptron was just taking this net and has a certain loss. I mean, I was evaluating the error here uh, by, by this net function. Now I want to say, if I stack up those things, do I get an advantage? So. What I want to say is, suppose I, uh, let me draw this nicely. Suppose I stack up so I have a bunch of here. And so each one of them has weights. So in here, I have like a, I have a net which is a, a linear function, and I have a output that gives me output here, which is f of the net, just like I had in there. But uh, the only difference between those two nodes here is that I have two perceptrons. Uh, this one also has a net. And an output, f of the net. Output, yes. Output. What's the difference between this and this? The weights are different, right? So the set of weights that this guy has here, w1, uh, w2, uh, up to wd, right? Uh, they are different than this one. This is w1, let's call it v1. V1, V2, up to Vd. These are the weights for this guy, and that's the weights for this other guy. So these are like multiple perceptrons. Let's say I have here uh, a bunch of them. So I have, uh, this is the input layer. And this is the uh, H layer. I have a bunch of those. And I can use now this as inputs to create another perceptron or, or structure like this with, right? So I can have another one here that says uh, so these are yet some other weights, right? I have H of those. 
one, two, three, up to H. This is way two, way three, up to way H. And again, this in here has a net. I'm going to call this output here H, H1. So this is uh, X1, X2, X3, up to Xd. This is uh, H1, H2, up to H, capital H. And here, this output, which is the same uh, form, so let's call it C. So I can have two of these. We not trade them, them separately. So you're right. If I am to train two perceptrons with the same data, with the same algorithm, I'm going to get the same exact weights, right? But it's not like we train them separately. There's some connection between them. Uh, but they have total separate weights. Yes. Doesn't, doesn't so this every perceptron here, every every node, you want to think of this as a box, as a unit, or like a procedure, has its own input which could be common. This has the same input as this text, right? But it has a different functionality. Although it's the same uh, uh, the same form, it has a linear and then a non-linear application. It has different weights. We'll have to see how we get there. So I have a question. So why does every node in the second layer have to be connected to every other node in the first layer? Uh, so to get a linear, you're asking why, why there's a line here? Oh, for all of them. Right. right, because how do I get the linear function? To get a linear function, every, every, every one of these segments corresponds to a weight, right? If I don't have this line, what does that mean? It means, I mean, this is just a drawing. Uh, you can draw it in a different way. Like if you don't like my lines, you can put some, you know, I don't know, dots or something. Like, I'm sure you're not asking why there's lines, I'm asking you why the weights. Each line corresponds to this uh, a particular weight. If I don't put a line, what does it mean? I'm not allowing that coefficient to exist. Right? So that's not what I want to do. In practice, do it, especially when we do regularization, we may get this effect that some of these weights are zero, so we, we, we but we don't want us to determine in advance which ones are zero. We, if we want to say we don't want many weights to be non-zero, we can impose that with a regularization or some other constraint. But we want the algorithm to figure out which ones have the right to be non-zero. So this is saying this perceptron can use this, this line, this connection, to put a weight on it if it finds it useful. Yes? Can these weights be termed as importance for that feature? Uh, yes. In general, if you look, if you look at the uh, L1 regularized regression, then definitely high weights correspond to important features. However, if I have a lot of a lot of features and I don't impose a little one constraint, meaning I'm allowing a lot of weights, it may not be clear that the the ones I've seen are necessarily the most important one. O on average, typically that's the case. Higher weights, either high positive or high negative, are corresponding to things that matter. Whenever you see a weight of zero, it means that feature is not interesting, or it has been compensated by other features, right? If I have two identical features, I can use one and not use the other one at all. Because everything I put on this one, I could have put on the other one. Suppose I take a feature and I do it. But if I impose certain regularization constraints, I can get that effect guaranteed. So I would say if that's my purpose, which is a very interesting machine learning purpose, a lot of jobs in industry right now are actually that question. 
not how or what performance I get or what algorithm should I use, but rather I have a data. Can you tell me what features are important for my data for this particular task? Like in medical domain, this is by far the biggest question. Uh, which tests or which drugs are the one that matter for whatever classification performance I get. Some of these tests, by the way, are very expensive. So for a hospital, it matters a lot what test to perform and when. And they, they, it, they're, not, they're not an e ideal, you know, in, in theory, we think, hey, if you need a test, healthcare, you know, insurance, you should get it. But if you have, you know, millions of people and the test is like $4,000 just to do a scan, you are not sure, you gotta quantify the not sure exactly to figure out if you do that test or not. Um, there's more interesting questions recently about this, I'm making a larger parenthesis, about self-driving cars. Self-driving cars, how they drive? What drive a self-driving car? This is the brain of a self-driving car. I mean, not exactly this one, <laughs> but, but that self-drives a car. So decisions of a car are very interesting. It's a very open area, a lot of debate about it. Mathematically, algorithmically, computationally, how fast can you make it work, right? I mean, even if you get to the right decision, Sometimes the car has to make that decision very, very fast. So it's a question of you have the computation to do it very fast. And there is a bunch of legal questions. If the decision is wrong, who's at fault, right? Cars, self-driving cars will do bad things. And then we're gonna have a lot of arguments about who's at fault. Is it the computer? Is it the person who wrote the algorithm? Is it the owner of the car? Is it the manufacturer? Who's at fault? But nevertheless, that's a very interesting Recently, very interesting questions about uh, that. What features matter? Okay, back to this. More, more on it. Uh, so, uh, if we find so, can this this will obviously lead to the use of this particular technique for reduction of those features? But how important would this technique? So, we as far as feature selection goes, so let's pick some features that matter and ignore the rest. Uh, we, we're not going to address this with these algorithms. Uh, what we're going to do is going to address the issue of redundancy. If I have three features that mean the same, can I just use one of them? Number one. Number two, if I only want to use four features, which four should I use? But that will sacrifice performance. So in practice, neural networks, that's how this is called, right? And not concerned too much about using only four features. So as far as computation goes, my computer cannot handle many features. I only want four of them. This is not uh, interested in that sort of thing. Neural networks are extremely fast, even for many features. So uh, as far as computation goes, I don't need to do that. Uh, this is an interesting issue, again, when people try to debug what happened. Like if I had to justify why my turn turn right and kill somebody when my car did that or why my medical procedure tell me, release this patient, I release him, and then the guy died, right? It, when you come up to, 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 especially in court, to justify certain things, you gotta explain computer algorithms in a language that humans can understand. That's very difficult to do with many features, much easier to do with fewer features, right? Like a decision tree, it's self-explanatory. You can look at the tree and see uh, what happened here. Because how many features a, a decision tree has? Not that many. In here, I could have many, many features and not have a computational problem because by now we know how to multiply matrices very efficiently, especially with, say, graphics cards. Okay? All right. So I'm going to move on. Okay? Now, first question is is this useful? Am I going to get more uh, or better or different than that? Is this going to do more than that? So here's before you guys think about it, I'm going to say, what happens if I don't use the F? So suppose F is identity. I can know F. Identity means F of X equals X, right? So F doesn't do anything. In that case, if I, what is this gonna be without F? 
So Z, who's Z? Is the sum of some weights, uh, let's call this weights. Um, so I have here x's are uh, indices by i. This is uh, i, right? H is I have them index uh, by j, and z's I have them index by k. So uh, that, that's for you guys to be able to follow. Of course, all those indices are from one to d or from one to h. But when I say uh, I, I refer to this. When I say J, I refer to those. When I say K, I refer to those. Just to, to have an easy way to follow. So the weights from here to here, I'm going to call the weights uh, K, J. So from layer K to layer J. Don't do this. <laughs> so this is from layer uh, J to layer K. And the other the other ones here would be weights. I'm going to call those uh, Ji from layer I to layer now, so whose weights are here in, in, in use? When I say Z, whose weights Z is using? This is the sum uh, for what? It's running over H things, right? So sum of uh, J, J times H. vector of h is output is going to take its particular weights. So this is a k1, k2, k3, up to kh, k capital H. But now each h is its own summation, right? So that's going to be a sum over WKJ uh, times, now who's HJ? Summation of, of uh, WJI of XI, right? Something like that? So this is a, a sum over J and this is the sum over Good. Now, is this different than that? That that whole thing in there, is it different than this? I mean, I mean, it has more weights in it. But is it something, the final result of this, can I have produced it with that thing or not? I think if you look at this grouped by xi, right, is there a way to write this as a sum of some other weights? Let's call them u. Who's u? Right? Who's this guy? U, ui times xi. Can I produce them this, this way? Is there, is there a way to group these things together to say that's not, that's not different than a linear combination except the weights that are some particular summations or whatever, right? Is this a sum of xi times some weights? So if you, if you look at the math, maybe you can figure out ui whose exactly has to be to correspond to weight. So that's just, a, that's just another linear classifier, right? That's a linear or net of x i. So that's not different, right? If if the, the this is a well-known thing in linear algebra, if I apply a linear transformation on top of another linear transformation, it's still a linear transformation. So I'm not I'm not getting anything. 
But what happens if I have the f's? Right? So that, that's the case of f not doing anything. Now suppose f is some function like logistic function or some other nonlinear function. Why does it have to be nonlinear? To avoid this linear on top of linear on top of linear, it's still linear, but if one of those is not linear, I'm breaking that chain. Right? So what if f exists, then what is this? Say sigmoid, that's the one. F of sum of that, right? WKJ, HJ. Which is who? <coughs> sum over J of WKJ. different f's, but nobody does that. In practice, it's much easier to just use some f in here, some non-linear f, and just keep going with that one. But in, in theory, we could use one f here and a different f here if we want. Um, so is this different than this one? By this one, I mean including the f now. If I put the f there, I'm asking, is it the same as f of something? So f of something was, for example, the logistic function, right? logistic function. That was a, a sigmoid of linear applied to data and optimized. This is a, a little bit more complicated. It's a sigmoid applied to a summation of sigmoids which you were applied to data. Is that, can this be mimicked by a simple logistic regression function? Can I get a logistic function to magically? What I did here, I say there are some weights used that you can compute and get exactly the same outcome. Yeah, are there some weights in the logistic function to get this? Can I figure out some W's or some use for the logistic function that will do this? No. This is not F of sum of U uh, I inside. In general, of course, there might be some particular cases when it happens. Uh, this, it's complicated mathematics in general. There is a very powerful theorem that says this form here, zk equal f of sum over j over wkj f of w over i, wj i, xi. This particular form can match any function. So if I have the right weights and the right number of layers here and all of that, I can map into any mathematical function. Obviously, logistic regression cannot do that. Right? But this one can. This is only useful for pure mathematicians. In practice, this theorem is useless. Even though it can map any function, how to do it, how to get those weights to map a function, that's not easy to do. Now, uh, any function, of course, our output, our, our, um, what's the function that we care about? Y equal some function of x, right? Where f is the truth, the ground. There's some function, some, some divinity that produces this outcome, given an x, a patient or an email produces the label of that patient, sick or not sick, or spam or not spam. And we assume this is a function in what sense? That if the same patient, the identical patient comes again tomorrow, it will get the same label, right? We assume in machine learning that it's not possible to get two identical patients with different labels. Of course, in reality, that can happen. But, but in here, that would cause a problem for any algorithm. So in that sense, data sets 
all have this property. You don't you don't see often a data set which it has two emails with different labels. Therefore, that's a mathematical function. Therefore, there is a neural network that matches it. Uh, but it's impossible to find it that way. So this guy is a famous, called Mogorov, very famous mathematician who wrote this stuff up. Okay, so how do we do it? How do we, let's get down to earth now. We have back in reality. We want to produce the weights for this network. Uh, so how did we do it here? We started with some weights, and effectively what the gradient descent did was a back and forth. It says, okay, the weights you have, the ones I, I initialize with, it, it, it calls a feed forward. Apply them to x, I get an answer. Then at this level, what I do? I compare my answer, my prediction, with the truth, and depending how that went, I, I figured out a technique to get some feedback into the weights. That technique was gradient descent, right? I took the loss, I differentiated, and I figured out you need to update the weights in the following way to improve things. And then once I did that, I recalculated forward, right? And then I say, okay, where am I standing now? Is it good or bad? And then I redo my update that's backward, right? So we like to think that in this way, this is a forward. When we apply our existing network to the input to get an output, and this is backward, back, uh, which is, this is a computation or prediction. This is back update. And the, what gradient descent did was going back and forth until things settled to some equilibrium, right? This way I've computed my predictions, this way I've updated my weights, computer prediction, updated the weights, so on and so forth, so on and so forth, until my gradients become zero, so that be no change, right? If this doesn't cause any update, then all my computation will remain the same. Well, how about it here? If I want to apply the same idea here, the forward part, it's easy, right? Let's assume I have all these weights. Uh, that's just computing the same step as in there, twice. I go from here to here, apply the weights, apply the sigmoid f on top of them, or some other f that's not in there. I get the output h's, and then I apply my other set of weights to obtain the final output, right? So the forward way is just, is this, this one, right? This is forward. Because this Z is applying computer. We're going to call this a hidden layer here. This is input that we see, output that we can match against our targets, and this is a hidden layer. So I can do this and this, and I get my forward. How about backwards? Backwards is where there's some dependence between those nodes. They, they effectively, the training happens in the backward step, right? The backward step dictates how to change those weights. Because I could start with any weights I want, and I get some loss there. And now, how do I change the weights? That's not independent of each other. Because when I propagate things backwards, I'm going to have a, several derivatives here, right? Neural gradients. They're going to start having some dependence because from here, there is a back update that translates to both all those two, and then from there, they translate to x's. And then they apply to the same data to go backwards, so forward. So how do we do this? Let's say the the output here, the loss, is for all weights. Same loss we've seen before. Sum over k, this layer, of uh, yk minus zk squared. So zk is my output, and yk is the truth. So 
length. So I'm comparing my output to the truth. That's up to me to set up how I want it. Suppose I have a multi-class classification problem with red, blue, green, yellow, four categories, red, blue, green, yellow. How many outputs I'm gonna have? I can have four outputs, red, blue, green, yellow. So how am I gonna match if my prediction is corresponding to the truth or not? I'm gonna, it's not our max, I'm gonna predict the hot output. So I'm gonna predict something, 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 and if the truth is red, right? Suppose I have four nodes here. Red, blue, green, yellow, right? Then if I, if I produce some numbers, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and the truth is 1, 0, 0, 0, I'm gonna map into a, this is called a hot vector, right? It's one bit is one, the rest are zero. I can measure the errors in each one of those in some of them. That's not the only loss I can use. In fact, one of the things that you're gonna see in neural networks, you can define many, many losses for whatever problem you have. But as a simple notion, let's use this one that says you have a bunch of outputs, and they don't have to be binary, but we measure the error as a sum squared for each output uh, summed up. So the difference between what my output is and what the truth is. Let's do these weights first. WKJ weights update. Those are the weights close to out. Right? And those weights here. If I differentiate my loss to one such way. Um, so again, who's the net? Net is the dot product between the weights and the ages. And because this z is a compound, uh, so j is a function of z, and z is a function of the net, and net is a function of the linear sum, right? There's a certain way to take derivative of the, you guys remember that? Sure. F of g of x differential, well, how that works, f prime of g times g prime of x, right? J at Z is easy to do, right? That's one half YK minus Z. Because the two goes away with the two. I think I, I need a minus in there. yk minus zk stays, and then I have a minus zk that become a minus. 
How about CK and net K? That's F prime, right? This function that applies on top of net to give me the output of Z. So we can differentiate the sigmoid, and there's a certain formula for it. This is exactly the And who is this? Net K is the dot product differentiated with respect to one of the variables or one of the coefficients. What do I get? Okay. What do I get? H, because this is the H as you see, right? So the, the net in there is W times the H. If I only differentiate with respect to one coefficient, I get that H. Hands up who's with me. Hands up, don't be shy if you if you are with me, that is. Well let's see some questions. See, this is just math. Uh, you could do very well in this class without understanding the math. I shouldn't say that, but it's true because the whole grade comes from the assignments. But if you continue with machine learning, understanding math is essential. Are you showing us an example of doing backwards? Uh, we won't have time for an example in class. There is an example in the notes, and you could go through it. And Kitchen will show you two more examples on a computer and then how it actually happens. But it's kind of too tedious in class to do an example. But I think there are some online, so we can, we, you can certainly take a look. Look, we're explain how we got uh, y k minus z k. This? Mm -hmm. So how much is this differential with respect to z k? That was j, that function, differential with z k. How much is the differential of this? Oh, it is to x, so it is to x. So I have, if I want to differentiate uh, a constant minus x squared, the whole differential of it. What is it? 2x. It's 2, 1 half, c minus x stays, and then it's minus, minus there's a minus from the minus x differential, right? So 2 times 1 that goes away, c minus x, and the minus sits in front of it. All right? We happy with that? How about the other one? Uh, we should write the update here, but uh, let me differentiate that one. So WJI. be this way here. Differential of J with respect to the weight J I is C. Differential of J with respect to H. Differential of H So I want to take all the way from the top where I measure the loss, differential with respect to these weights here. And I break that differential into differential of j with respect to some h, say hj, this one coming here. And then once I have a differential here, I propagate that differential down to whatever branch I have, right? Because my w, uh, if this is xi, this weight, this is hj, what weight is this one here? So that's the one I'm taking the differential on. So the propagation will happen from all the losses, because it's a summation, 
down to that Hj, and then from Hj down to that exon to obtain an update for this way. So what is uh, this one? Well, let's see. This one here is the differential of one half over k, y k minus square with respect to y j. And times, how much is this? What's the relationship between h and the net? So h is the stuff that leaves from here, the net is here. It's F, so F dash is the differential of F. F dash of net J. And here, net J, what's the relationship between net J and this weight that I'm differentiating on, Ji? This is a top product of weights times Xs, so that will be? Xi, right? So how things have moved. This one ended up here. This one ended up here. And this one ended up here. Right? So we have to work on this part here. I say that is minus sum k y k minus e k differential uh, of z k I differentiate it first with respect to z, like before, then z with respect to net k, and net k with respect to hj. Yes. Um, why is there no sum in the top? Okay, The differential that we, we looked at was with respect to a kj weight, right? With respect to a kj weight, only one node acts on that weight. E even if the loss is a sum over the nodes, that's what you mean? The other nodes do nothing. Only the node k has something to do with the, that weight, right? Okay. So when I sum up this plus this, there's another node here and there's another one here when I sum them up. These other nodes don't act on this when you hit WJ. So that differential is zero. That's a good point. In here, can I do that? If I take the differential with, with respect to this YJI here, this way, everybody who ends up here or here or here has nothing to do with this weight. But everybody who ends up here would have an impact on this weight. And every single node from the top has an impact on this intermediate or hidden node here. That's going to take a little while to, to settle this. Uh, although, the fun part is, even though this looks complicated mathematically, when you implement it, you only need the update rule, right? So we, we, you don't need to take all the derivatives to write the program, because when you write your program, you only need the actual update rule and run gradient descent on it and see what happens. So uh, let's finish this up. So this is a sum, right? So what's
what my update rule is going to be. I get all this. This is the gradient absent, uh, gradient descent rule, right? The way updates work. This is the sum over k I've got from here, yk minus zk. Delta zk at net k, that's f prime of net k. Delta net k at hj. What's the relationship between net k? That's this one right here. Net k. And WKJ, it's HJ, right? So when I differentiate, this is a linear sum, when I differentiate with respect to one of the uh, unknowns there, I get the Ws, right? Because in a linear sum, if you differentiate to one of the components of the vector, it's only that component that multiplies with that matters. Uh, and then F prime of net J is from here, Xi is from there. So that's going to be my update rule. Lambda is this learning rate, right, which we're going to keep fixed for now. And the update rule in here would be Is it going to work? If you're to go right now at home, implement those update rules and say, run, right? Press the button, 4i equal 1 to 10,000, run. What's going to happen? Is it going to work? It's not going to work. This is an assignment that people need a lot of time. I, I'm telling you from my, I told this class many times, and this is where you get this shock, press the button, boom, nothing happens. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those that, you know, when you, when, you, when you look at the decision tree, right, even though it didn't work from the first time, I, we still have one person that, that, that says it takes hours and hours and hours to run the decision tree from homework one. I think everybody except one person got it to run with decent performance and decent speed, right? But not from the first try, right? You run right the first time, didn't exactly happen what you wanted, yet something happened, right? You look at the tree and say, hey, what feature did you pick? What ratio did you pick? Does that make sense? Oh, I have a bug in my code. Okay, let's fix it, run it again, right? In here, be like, damn, nothing <laughs> happens. <laughs> what do I do now? So that's going to take more time. Uh, in particular, you can see mathematically why that is. Let's have a speculation. Why is it that things can go very bad? Yes. The gradient can become zero, so when you keep on multiplying, eventually the rates become so low that if you don't pick a good non-linear... So scale, he's talking about things can be so small in here that the updates are too small. Maybe you can compensate with some heuristic learning rate. Say that, you know, it's, yeah. Another different reason, more conceptual, why this... Now giving the... going wrong in the matrix multiplication. What? Going wrong in the matrix multiplication, the order is not proper. 
Uh, I don't know what you mean. The matrix multiplication itself, W times X's or W times H's, that's easy to do. No, if you don't specify the proper size. Ah, that, that, the, the, the program you use should complain about that, right? I mean, MATLAB, if you use MATLAB, it's going to complain, say, does matrices don't multiply together. That's easy to fix. Uh, by the way, for matrix multiplication, you should use a routine. In Python or Java, you should not implement your own matrices and your own multiplication. Uh, I'm not worried about that. Another reason for which things will go bad, more conceptual. Yes. Just that it's hard to understand the model, so the data or not is better or worse with the decision tree that I see. From a human perspective, that's not what I meant, but he's right. From a human perspective, it's extremely hard to tell, am I going in the right direction? Something happened, I can see some update. I have no clue whether that's good or bad. Uh, this was the reason for which neural networks were stuck for 15 years in the same exact stage in research. From 1985 to, to, to about 2005, 20 years, people have looked at those models and say, hmm, that's interesting. It can map any function I want, right? But nobody understood anything about them. So for a long time in academia research in computer science and artificial intelligence, there were those neural networks which were interesting ideas, but in practice they never work well enough. For every single problem in those 20 years people have tried to solve, there was always a better algorithm to do it. A faster, a better. So they remain in this state of interesting, 100,000 papers written, but nobody was using them. Until somebody figured out, okay, this is how we should do it. And then since 2005, they picked up. Now, most machine learning in the world is done in neural networks. Like 85% of it, face recognition robots, driving cars, predicting sickness. It's mostly done with neural networks. In fact, chances are if you updated your phone last year, your phone has a neural engine in it. You knew that? That the new phones? have uh, built in their CPU. Now, now there's a, uh, how they call SOC, like silicon, all the silicon is built in one chip, including the graphics processor, the, and everything is built in one silicon, right? They have the main CPU, which includes the pipelines and the arithmetic units, right? They have the GPU, and they have what's called a neural computer, which is the same philosophy as NVIDIA has with those neural computing cards, right? NVIDIA can sell you a card that has, has no video output, right? And it's designed for doing neural computation. Uh, how they call it? They have names, right? TPU, right. And, and, and those, those cards are specially designed to facilitate that sort of computation. They are a little different than graphics cards that are used for graphics and games, but very similar. So the idea comes from graphics cards. People have tried to use graphics cards for this. I'm going to tell you later why graphics cards are more suitable than a CPU for this kind of computation. But then Nvidia said, wait a minute. If you guys really want graphics cards to do this, I'm going to create some special graphics cards that are better suited for neural networks than the regular graphics cards. And from there, Apple and Google and other big manufacturers took the idea, how about we build we modify some part of our silicon, the chip, to include this neural computation because the standard CPU is not well suited for this computation. And the standard GPU is better than CPU, but still not well suited. So if I make some silicon specifically designed for this, I can actually do a lot of computation like this on a phone. So a lot of AI that happens in small devices actually comes from hardware specifically designed to do this. And now it's at scale. Everybody who updated their phone last year got this neural chip in it. All the uh, AR, how is it called? Augmented reality uses the same chip. All the encryption and some other functions use that chip. Um, but I still didn't get an answer to my question. Why is this getting stuck? Because each layer depends on the previous one? No. Uh, I would assume the gradients as they go from the output to the input, they become so low as to not create... He already said that. Yes. Maybe because the cost of that we are saying over here is not convex. 
uh, you going into interesting direction, but the loss function itself is complex. You can see right there, sum of the squares, that's a complex function. But, but that's complex in Zs. So what happens if we look at the minimums of this as a surface, right? How many variables I have here? How many weights are in this layer? Total values. K times uh, D times H, right? Yeah. And how many weights I have here? How many outputs times how many H, right? For each one of those, I have a weight. There's a lot of weights in there. If you look at the surface of the, the objective surface, that's probably what you yeah. meant or what you wanted to go to. Not in terms of this, but in terms of the Ws, right? There's a lot of minima in there and maxima. That surface is not convex at all. So that surface will look like something like this. So it's very easy to get stuck in all kinds of points here, especially with the metal like gradient descent. And that wouldn't be the point you are in. In fact, this, is be, this would be nice. It's not like this. It's something like this. So I can get stuck here looking for a minimum. That's very far away from a minimum. So neural networks are hard to get right because by this kind of numerical optimization methods, it's almost impossible to get to a good network. And the methods we have, like gradient descent, are specifically designed to not get out of here. Once they get locked into a minima, they can't get out. Unless you do some sort of jumping, but then you lose the optimization you just believe. So in practice, when we don't have better ideas, and we won't have better ideas for a while, uh, <laughs> we can try to optimize it starting from different points. Like literally try to optimize it you know, 20, 50 times from different initiations. Because right? I have to start with some Ws, initial Ws. So I can start with some random Ws, optimize the network, start with a different set of Ws, optimize the network, and so on and so forth, and see which one gives me the best meaning. Uh, since 2005, when those became interesting and applicable practice, a lot of people have worked on how to train neural networks better, how to start with better initialization weights, how to, the second time you train it, not start with the same with something that's random compared to the same one. Like if the same one went in a, the, the first one went to a, a certain way, how to start the second network. And finally, uh, people have thought, can I add another layer? Can I do everything I've done, but now with two layers, or one hidden layer, but are two hidden layers, or three hidden layers? Mathematically, it all works out, right? I mean, you can see how these differentials, I can do one more layer on top of them. And uh, not just that, they, they wrote code. There's packages that people use, like TensorFlow, that takes the differentials for you. So you only have to define the network structure. Here's the input, here's the hidden layer, here's the outputs. And you have to define the loss function, how you want to measure the quality at the top. And the TensorFlow will do the differential optimization of the whole network for you. And you can use better than gradient descent for that purpose. And even further, people have thought, how about we dedicate different layers for different purposes? So once I have two or three or five layers, I can design the bottom layer to do something like has been mentioned, something with features. The, the first layer is essentially a feature selector. I didn't tell you how that works, but this essentially outputs whatever features are interesting. And then the network that I showed you here starts from the second layer that says, now that I have those features, I can turn the network to get an output and make a prediction. This is particularly useful for images. We didn't see that yet, but for images, it's hard. Image come like a matrix of pixels. So I can literally use every single pixel value as a feature, and I have you know, 3,000 by 3,000, 9 million feature values, right? Those are not very interesting because it's hard to make sense of what does it mean for a pixel to be red versus blue versus green. Because you don't see the big picture around that pixel and you have 9 million of them. So 
people have recognized it's very very early in images. It doesn't make sense to use every single pixel as a value. So how do we create from 9 million pixels some useful 300 features? People have also seen this in, in, in text when they said, can you give me uh, a vectorial representation of 300, say, a vector of 300 values for a piece of text or for a word or for a paragraph or for a tweet in such a way that this is a quantitative representation, not sparse, not zero one, it's a real values, as opposed to 100,000 different words that are on or off in the tweet. So this is a particular useful application of neural networks that we won't do much in this term, but if your plan is to get a job quickly using neural networks, you should study how these, these layers here can act as feature selectors before you actually implement the classifier. So that would be a good project for this course. If you want to do a project, for example, how do you design these deep networks, deep meaning more than one layer, two layers, three layers, in such a way that the bottom of the network addresses the data, takes the images or text or patients or whatever I have in raw format. Because the spam data set you have, it's not in raw format. I already extracted the features for you. How do you take that and produce uh, not so many features that are useful and do the classification with neural networks or any other algorithm. The useful in having a neural network is that if I, if I plug in this layer with the rest of the network, I can train the whole thing at once. If I use this as a feature selector, then I have to do the feature selection first and then use those features to train an algorithm separately. And then I have these problems so of I don't know if I extract the right features. The advantage here is I can train the feature selector and my algorithm in one shot, in one big network. So for the next homework, you're gonna have to do two things. You're gonna have two problems, two neural network problems, tasks that you have to implement in neural network. One is called the autoencoder, we're gonna talk about that today, and one is a typical straight supervised classification problem. But for each of them, you have to write two networks. One written by you from scratch that you have to actually, <coughs> like with the decision tree, you have to create the three nodes, you have to create the links, you have to take the derivatives, you have to do the outputs, all of that. And the same problem, you're gonna run to a neural network package like TensorFlow and see what that does. Check, question. So when you say uh, Uh, are you saying that the features will change? Or uh, will it select one set of features? And right, so we have to little, do a little bit of uh, kitchen management there. If I use certain features and a certain design in here for my training set, it wouldn't make sense to extract a different feature for the testing set and then apply the same network, right? So that we have this issue of normalization. No, no. If you do some normalization on training set, you gotta use the same normalization on test. Not that way. The same run as in the same next iteration, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Right. So when people say runs, usually means from scratch a different run. Okay. But a different iteration, it may change how the feature selection works. In fact, a lot of feature selections are designed specifically for the data you have. For images, those would be little chunk of the image. For text, might be chunks of the text. And the feedback will call for a different chunk, maybe. We didn't get into that. I don't want to get into this before we get to feature selection. And you guys never seen images yet, did you? Do we have yet the data set with images? No, very soon. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about feed forwards and backwards. Right, Kitchen, you should set up. So was this the So uh, let's, let's not uh, worry about uh, formal definitions here, okay. just intuition. Forward, the network takes an input, I have my weights, right. and I do the calculation that direction. Right. And I get a prediction, and I can measure my error. Right. Backward is when I get the error 
I take the differentials and using those update, I update the network, it will be this first and then this part. So forward is this way, feed forward means computation this way. When I do testing, predictions, I only do the forward part, right? I have my network, I get the test point, I plug it in, and I get an out. It's backwards, the only way that you get an explicit. Backwards or back propagation right. is how do I propagate the errors to update my weights. It's not a prediction, it's not a computation mode. Backward is propagating the error to update the weights. And you get a different set of update formulas if you do back propagation? I get those formula. This is the backwards. Right. But you couldn't have got those if you did forward propagation. No, forward, the only thing you get is here. Forward, given the x, I get the second layer, and given the second layer, I get the output. That's not changing the weights. It's just producing some value. Backward is taking the error, get the gradients, and update the weights based on that. Um, uh, if you said that having just one hidden layer and theoretically match any function, why have more? Why, why have more? Good question. I was just about to ask that. <laughs> Anybody has an answer? Why have more? If one layer can do the job. Remember, I also said that's a theory. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a practical answer. That's in theory you can have, yes. Like more combinations of features. More you can hope that, the, the, first of all, you get the better optimization of all. <coughs> and you can also design those layers to do something very specific, okay. like feature extraction, if you want. Okay, that is the same. But if I'm just adding more uh, layers with the hope of getting a better result. But since the theory says that I can get uh, the same result with just two layers, why would I go to add an, uh, another layer and not change the layer that I already have? You can do that, but um, it's it's not like you're going to end up with a network that's very performant necessarily with one layer. So the theory said you can find that function, but in practice it's almost impossible to find it. If you have multiple layers, you let the computer uh, a little bit more flexibility into how to get in and out of those layers. But there are other optimization algorithms also like, that can deal with the problem of uh, getting stuck at local minimum. Right. So far, as far as I'm aware, even the most fancy algorithms are not going to be able to do in principle with deal with all the dimension of the neural network. Yes. Maybe that can help his questions, does that mean that deep neural nets, like if we could figure out how to get the best function with one layer, that deep neural nets wouldn't be needed? Well, again, depends. Uh, if most of the layers at, at the bottom are selection layers, are generated features layers, or some other uh, criteria to, to get rid of selecting of data or selection of features or deal with some correlations of so those layers, you can't necessarily replicate with a single hidden layer. But in theory, as far as I know, I don't, I don't, I didn't see the proof of this theorem, so, but we can look it up. Uh, what do they mean by mapping any function? I think it's correct. Uh, I also think, uh, as far as I know about neural networks, nobody uses this theorem to do anything in practice. So Kitchen has some uh, TensorFlow set up for you, and he has some, I don't know if you do the homework problems or some other problems, the homework problems. So the TensorFlow version, the easy version, you know, the ones that just plug into TensorFlow. TensorFlow is nice because you write your network in Python, then you, when you have the design, you pass it through and say, deal with it, right? <laughs> and TensorFlow takes it from there, it does the optimization and all that. The hard part, of course, for you would be to do optimization yourself. So let me uh, let him speak. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I just answer the You should turn off the switch behind you. The switch behind you? Oh, yeah. um, so, so first we need to install the It's very easy. Uh, it's really easy. You can just um, just install the So to, there are many different versions. So to keep consistency, uh, we will use TensorFlow 1.4.0. So we can install it in this way. And after installation, we can input something like this to type the version. You see here, this is version. If you see, if we, if you successfully print out the version, then you install it successfully. So 
for more details, you can go to the TensorFlow official website. So you can check there are some more information here. It's saying that if you want to install different versions, maybe it's easier to or convenient to use the virtual environment. So I have some uh, TensorFlow tutorial here. There are some links you can check in, in the other. So after you install it, um, so you think you can make the, the text bigger? Uh, later? Yeah, I mean, later I will, like, my code. Yeah. Is that but even the website, can you make it bigger? Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, but we will not use this website now. So, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. So TensorFlow, uh, to write a TensorFlow program, this is little bit different from a regular Python program because you need to define it. because TensorFlow is mainly used for uh, running the neural networks so you need to predefine the, the structure of your neural network and in TensorFlow this structure or you call it this graph we call it graph this graph is static which means you cannot change it during training so this is a little bit inconvenient um, because if you have different input I mean if your input has different size, then you cannot ch you cannot fit them into the same graph because the, the graph is fixed. You cannot have different size, uh, different size of coefficient. So, uh, but we will not deal with this in this homework. So, um, just let you know this is the difference between TensorFlow and other tools. So, and in our homework three, we will need. We will ask you guys to implement two different uh, models, which means two different graphs. Uh, one is the multi-layer perceptron, and the other is the autoencoder. So, um, so let's first look at what the graph, what the what does the graph mean here? The graph is like uh, really a graph consists of two parts, two modules. One is the model structure, the other is the loss function. So you will have the your model structure, um, where you take the input, uh, take your data as input, and output your predictions. And you will compare the predictions with the ground truth labels, and you will have some loss function. Um, and also, okay, uh, and you will have an optimizer like the gradient descent optimizer to help you to propagate the the error to your coefficients um, to update the coefficients. So for example, this is the graph for the multi-layer perceptrons. So basically, we have two layers, one hidden layer and one output layer. So if you look at the model, so first we fit into the features here, into the model. And what inside is take the feature as input and this is the first layer and the top one is the second layer. So first layer we'll call it hidden layer. You should um, you need to multiply your feature in feature with the hidden waste called hidden W and then add the bias in this hidden layer. Then you fit this output into the second layer where is the output layer and you do the same thing you multiply by the input with the with the coefficients w and add the bias b, and then you got your prediction. So this task is the multi-class classification. So it's different from the spam spam based problem. You in this case you have three classes, and so our output is we have uh, our output is the vector which has three which in three scores. Um, so you have this output, this is your prediction, and you compare it with your with your labels, which is the group truth. So yeah, here is the labels. And you feed your feed the labels and your predictions into this loss module. And you will have a loss function. So for example a mean square error function or like the cross entropy function in logistic regression. And then, 
and then the TensorFlow will help you to compute the gradient and back propagate. Um, so you don't need to worry about this gradient back propagation. Um, and this is the graph. So let's see how it works in the code. So in your homework, you need to implement this um, tensor, TensorFlow program. So and this time, we will ask you to use the data set, the Y data set, something like this. So it, the, the format is very similar to the housing data. So you will have each line represent a data point, and the first column is the, is the label, it's the target. So you will see there are three classes, so the, tar the label is from it's one to three. And the rest are the features. So in your in the homework, you need the function to read this data and read this data into your TensorFlow um, graph. So, and usually, um, when people have a very complex neural networks, they will, um, the way they organize their code is they have two different Python files, one for building the model, the other for building the training method. So, like what I did here, this class, I call it MLP, which means a multi-layer multi perception. So you should have a separate file for this class. This is your model. And in your model, uh, first you need to have some hyperparameters for training, which is like learning rate, or the number of hidden units, or the number of the input size, something like this. So you need to predefine these hyperparameters. Uh, the way you save these hyperparameters is via these flag variables in TensorFlow. So it's very convenient because if your model is very complex, then you may have like hundreds of hyperparameters. So it's easy to use this flag variable to save all these hyperparameters. Mm. And then you will have some placeholders. So placeholders means, so when you design the model, uh, you don't know what the exact value of this placeholders, but you only know the size of these placeholders. Um, so placeholders represent the, your input data. So because when you design the model, when you build the graph, you don't know what the input will be. So but you really what you know is the size of the input. So here you just have some placeholders here, just just leave some space for this input. Now what's next? You will have variables. So variables is your coefficients, so it's double and bias here. And what, what you need to pay attention is, uh, in this case, uh, so in homework, in the homework two, uh, in homework one and homework two, I saw many students just use zero to initialize their coefficients, which is not a good choice here. So I show a paper in Piazza, you can check why where you don't want to use the zero to initialize this coefficient. The better way to do is, is you can draw some random values from a, a normal distribution, like what I did here. So you initialize your coefficients from some normal distributions. So because we have two different layers, so we have W and we have two groups of W and V here. And then you need to define your model structure. The so model structure is how you take all this input and how you take all this input, how you deal with this input, and then output a prediction. So here, the first layer, what I use is uh, a linear transformation here, is wx plus b, and followed by a nonlinear transformation, a sigmoid function. And the, this one, uh, and this output is the the transformation for the output layer. After you have this model structure, you need to define the loss function here. So in this case, because this is a multi-class classification problem, so you, you may want to use the cross entropy loss. So this is similar to the uh, logistic regression loss, just a generalized version. Um, and then you need to define your optimizer. You can use this. And uh, I think optimizer is fine. You can use the gradient descent optimizer or a dam optimizer. And also, so um, in this class, in, the, in your model class, you may want to define two functions, one for the prediction, 
where take the take the feature as input and then output the labels. You need one function for prediction and another one for training, where you take the training data as input and um, do the forward pass, where to update your coefficients. So we see we define set, uh, this section here. So section is a um, very special variable in the TensorFlow. So after you define your graph, so session is the is one you, you need to use session to communicate with your graph. This is the like bridge between the outside world and the and the graph. So why we need this why we need this session is because uh, in in your graph you cannot print out the value of your variable. For example, if you want to um, this is different from the Python program. Say I have a variable, see I have a variable like hidden w here. I want to print out the value of it during training. If I simply do this, this is not true. So you will not it will not print out the value of it. It will just print out the, the shape of this of this like tensor. So what you need to do is you need to use your session to interact with this graph. Like you use session run or like what I did here. So this is called session run function. Dot, uh, session dot run function. You need to feed into the your data and define what what you want to print out. Like what you want to return. Like here, I want to return the output because this function is used to predict to return the labels give, uh, given the training data, given or given the, or the testing data. So I need to return the output. And I use this way to, I can use this way to get the exact value of this tensor, of this, um, of this variable. Mm, yeah, and I just said, so you need two separate Python files for this homework, one is to design the model, the other is to design the training function. So for training function, so first you need to read into your training data here. And you need to like not do the perform normalization. So remember we need to merge the training data side and testing data side and do the normalization together because you need to use the same approach to rescale, rescale the training and testing data. Um, so after normalization, you, you need to shuffle your data. Uh, yeah. After normalization, you need to shuffle your training data. And then you start a session here. This is the way how you define a session. Um, and then you need to run this initializer to initialize your coefficient, initialize those variables in, the, in your model, in the graph. So you call this function. And then you feed the training data into the into this model via session. You can see here. Yeah. So this function is used to train your model, where you take the x, y, which is the which are the training data. You take training data in, and you call your optimizer. Here you need to get the value of it. I mean, here you need to. Yeah to return the value of this optimizer and loss. So but whenever you call this optimizer, you you, call, um, you actually run the backpropagation method here. The TensorFlow will automatically handle it. So then you finish the training for Apple, for the Apple. Mm, we can run this code. So Like most many students did is, so this Adam, why, uh, the difference between this Adam op optimizer and the gradient descent optimizer is the ingredient descent, op op ingredient descent 
the learning rate is fixed. So actually, when, when, you, when, you, when you guys finish the home, if you finish homework, homework two, you will find that you may want to reduce your reduce your train, uh, learning rate. Because at the beginning, you may want a very big training learning rate, but after a few epochs, you may want to um, move a shorter step, and you need a smaller learning rate. So this is why I use this item optimizer. the training arrow, oh, it's not training arrow, sorry, it's training accuracy. So this accuracy is keep going up. And so for this data size, the final accuracy is around 0.97 something. Yes. This will be the baseline of your homework. <laughs> so this is accuracy. Now because we only have like uh, less than 200 data points here, so the training will be very easy. Just take a few seconds. Any questions? Is, is the same baseline going to be for our implementation also? Yes. Um. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so this is the supervised learning problem. Yeah, but you need to train your hyperparameters. So yes, yes, yes. But the autoencoder, uh, we don't have time now. We will do it next time. Uh, autoencoding is a special type of supervised learning designed for a certain purpose. We didn't talk about that, so that we're going to do on Tuesday. But every, anyway, anyway, now I think most people are concerned with homework two, so I, I don't think uh, anybody's going to start neural networks yet. Maybe Tuesday or so we need another demo. Thank you.